After work, my dad used to lie for hours in the tub. We were forbidden to ask why. If you lived in Oakland in the 90s, you probably heard of the grind, even if it was just in whispers. Outside of straight up selling drugs, it was the best way to make a steady income for people like my dad, who'd done time when I was a baby and couldn't get most jobs. Ever since he'd gotten out, dad had tried to stay on the straight and narrow, shunning old friends, keeping liquor out of the house. Work had always been a challenge though. Most places where he could get a job only paid the minimum, and half of those tried to short his hours. We'd been going through a particularly rough patch nothing in the fridge, scary letters from the power company and the landlord starting to pile up when an old prison buddy got dad a trial day at the grind. My mom was against it. She'd heard too many stories. The way guys came out of work bleary-eyed and quiet. Most of them started drinking the minute they got home and didn't stop until it was time to clock in the next day. My dad shrugged. If there was one thing he was good at, it was taking punishment. He'd been doing it his whole life for free. Might as well get paid for it. And the money was crazy, $25 an hour to start, going up to almost double that for the best people. I still remember his first day there. I was in sixth grade, and I spent the whole day staring out the window in a daze, wondering what dad was up to. Would he come back home the same guy he'd always been, or would he be like the ones in the rumors, the walking ghosts? Anxiety ate at my guts. I couldn't eat at lunch. Just before school let out, I ran to the bathroom and puked my guts out. At home, my mom fussed over mac and cheese my dad's favorite. She must have opened the oven door a dozen times. My younger sister, May, just ran around the house singing TLC songs, totally oblivious. Then, around 7.15, we heard keys jangling in the front door and my dad walked in. He was wearing a big smile, and his arms were full of gifts. He had hit them all on the way home. He handed me hers first. It was one of the now that's what I call music compilation CDs, which was really a gift to all of us. She'd been playing her old one non-stop for the last six months, and the whole household had memorized every song. Next, he plucked a shoebox out of the bottom of a bag and handed it to me. I opened it to reveal a pair of Air Jordans real ones. It took me a whole minute to realize they were actually mine, the right size and everything. It didn't even occur to me to put them on my feet until my dad suggested it, a big smile on his face. Darius, can we really afford all this? My mother asked. You won't believe it, but they gave me a signing bonus, my dad said. You ever hear of something like that? A signing bonus? Things are going to be different for us now. And he was right. Life got better a little at a time. Soon, there were no more letters from the landlord, no threatening messages from lenders on the answering machine. More days than not, I'd get home from school to smell meat cooking on the stovetop my mother happily humming some old Motown song as she cooked. Sometimes, though, at night, I'd hear my parents talking through the thin wall that separated our bedrooms. I'd catch these little snippets of conversations that set me on edge. S okay, baby. I can take anything they dish out. They're not allowed to touch me. Big bonus for me if they do. I just tune it all out. Pretend I'm Ali out there, dodging punches with a smile on my face. The bosses love the way I smile say they've never seen anything like me. Yet despite my father's reassurances, I knew the job got to him sometimes. There were days when he'd show up at the door looking glassy-eyed and head right to the bath without much more than a quick hello, and my mom would tell me and made to play quietly while my dad soaked in there. And other times, my dad would seem fine and then fly off the handle at the littlest thing. Like in seventh grade, my report card came back almost all A's with just a single B in algebra. And then suddenly my dad spiked his coffee cup on the kitchen floor, shattering shards everywhere, and screamed that he wasn't working this hard to see how only son pulls bees in math, and did I want to end up working at the grind like him? Tearfully, I promised I'd never bring home another bee again, and I kept my word. Maybe things would have been fine if my mom hadn't gotten sick. I was in ninth grade when she found a lump on her left breast. She caught it early, thank God, before it spread much. It was treatable but expensive. That night, I heard my parents talking through the wall again, their voices hushed and serious. We'll find a way to make it work, my mother said. We'll cut back on other stuff. Fewer new clothes. Run the AC a little less. It's not enough, my dad said. You know that. Level 2 isn't as bad as people say. They're not allowed to do any lasting damage. It's part of the contract. And the pay is almost double. Hell. 
We could afford the chemo and have enough left over for a trip to Disneyland. I won't let you, she said. It's not up to you. Things were a little different after that. My dad got a new suit he wore to work. It almost looked like the kind of one-piece flight suit an airplane mechanic might wear, except that it was covered in pockets of various sizes. There must have been at least 50 of them. They ran all over the suit, covering my father's arms and legs, even his back. What are they for? I asked, but my mother just told me to keep quiet. My father still tried to wear a smile when he came home, but it was through gritted teeth more often than not. He was a step slower now, always tired. His baths grew longer and longer. Some nights, he'd fall asleep in there, and my mother would have to practically drag him to bed, naked and dripping. We went to Disneyland that year. The pay was that good. But my dad could barely keep up with us as we ran from ride to ride. On Space Mountain, I screamed the whole time, amazed that my dad didn't even make a sound. And then as the ride slowed down, I looked over at him and realized he was asleep. Part of the problem was that my father started getting nightmares. I'd wake up in the middle of the night to hear him screaming. My mother had taken to sleeping down the hall on the couch in the living room. Don't go near him when he's having his terrors, she told me in May. He's not himself when he's in them. Night after night, I'd wake in the middle of the night to the sounds of his screams, like he was sizzling under burning needles, begging for someone to help. I couldn't have been more than a few feet from him, separated by a paper-thin wall. All I wanted was to be able to reach through it, to take his hand in mine and tell him he was okay. But I didn't. I just lay there as he screamed and screamed. Is daddy going to die? May asked me at breakfast one morning as he stared at her uneaten toast. He'll be fine, my mother interjected after I hesitated too long in my answer. Finally, that night I couldn't take it anymore. I woke at midnight to hear my father screaming louder than ever, and I ran in. I touched his hand, trying to wake him up. It's okay, Dad, I said. You'll be okay. He was sleeping in his boxers, sweating despite the fact that he wasn't under any covers. And in the dim moonlight, I saw just how bruised his body had become. Dark purple spots ran all along his abdomen and decorated his arms and legs, like he'd taken a hundred hits with a closed fist. What do you do? I asked softly. He then grabbed me by the throat, slamming me into the mattress. See how you like it he screamed. See how you like it, you rich motherfucker. He was staring right through me, yelling at some ghost. Never once before that night had I felt the true strength of his grip. If he'd wanted to, it felt like he could crush my windpipe as easily as a raw egg. How you like me now? He was screaming. What you gonna say to me now? And in that moment, I realized the anger had been there all along, coiling within my father like a spring in his heart, the pressure building a little each day, ready to unleash all at once, obliterating whoever happened to be in front of him that day. My legs were shaking my body convulsing at the lack of oxygen. I imagine what my father would think if he came to and found me dead in his hands. I tried to scream out, but there was not breath in me, no voice to speak. I'll kill you all he was screaming. Every last fucking one of you, and your families too. See how funny it is now, assholes. See how funny it is now. And then something human came back into his eyes as he finally saw me for me, and his hands went limp. Reggie, he mumbled. I'm so sorry. So sorry. I thought you were. But I just ran out of the room and huddled in my own bed. He didn't follow, and we never talked about it again. What does he do in there? I asked my mother one morning over breakfast, but she just shook her head. He does what he needs to. He's there to make a better life for you, me, and May. But what does he do? Reginald, she said. In this life. There are some things better left unknown. The sooner you learn that the better. Your father goes to that place every day so that you'll never catch a whiff of it. So that you'll never know what the inside looks like. Maybe I should have listened to her. Maybe I would have been better off if I'd just left that door closed. But that wasn't me. It was only a matter of time before I followed my dad to work. 